Well, Merry Christmas to you at both campuses. We are so glad that you are here. Uh, it is going to be a great day together. Let me ask a quick question. How many of you have all of your Christmas shopping done? Anybody in the room? All of it is completely done. How many of you would say that, no, 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 you still have, you know, that something special to pick up for that one special person that you love and respect in life? Anybody want to say that? Anybody? Anybody? Just to let you know, I wear a size large normally. No, seriously, uh, I don't know if you heard about the, the wealthy man who went Christmas shopping for his wife, uh, wanted to treat her very special, and uh, he goes out to a department store and uh, pulls up to the perfume counter, and the clerk comes and says, can I help you? And he says, well, I want to get something special for my wife for Christmas, and uh, I don't know, I just need you to help me pick something out. And so uh, the lady at the counter brings a $50 uh, bottle of perfume and, and, and hands it to the guy. And he's very nice. How much is it? She says $50. And uh, he goes, oh, um, that's a little bit pricey. Uh, could, could you maybe dial it back a little bit? Let's, let's aim for something a little bit less. And so the lady goes, yeah, no problem. And I'll go get something. And so she comes back and hands him a little bit smaller jar of the same perfume and, and basically says, uh, the guy says, oh, how much is this? And, and she says, well, this one's $30. And he goes, oh. It's very nice, very nice. But um, looking for something a little bit cheaper, maybe. Just a little bit cheaper. And, uh, and of course, you know, she goes, okay. And uh, comes back and hands him almost like a sample size. You know, like a little, and, and like, and he goes, well, how much is, is this? And she says, well, this one's $15. And the guy goes, ooh. Um, hoping for something a little, little bit cheaper. Um, do, you, do you have anything else? And she says, I'll be right back. She comes right back and uh, she says, if you want something cheaper, just look in the mirror. Right? <laughs> right? And my wife says I'm cheap. Okay, my, I don't think I'm cheap. I just say I'm frugal and that I'm honoring God and I'm being a good steward with all of the blessings that God has given to us. We're trying to steward that right. Amen. My wife says I am cheap, okay, cheap, cheap to the core. So I'm curious uh, this morning, how many of you would say that you have something in your life that you wish was different? Just something that you just wish was different. Uh, how about I ask it another way? How many of you would say there is something in your life, there is an area of your life where you're just not at peace? where there is just something broken, there is maybe a relational dysfunction, a tension. Uh, I don't know if it could be financial, it could be a health issue, but there is just a lack of peace in one area of your life. Anybody? Anybody? Um, the truth is, is that, you know, you, you sing the songs and you hear the things at Christmas time, it says peace on earth and goodwill toward men, and you expect all of that and you hope for all of that. But the truth is, is that for Christmas, especially uh, for some people, Christmas can be very, very difficult. There are people in this uh, gathering who, who, if you're honest, this is your first Christmas after losing somebody that you loved. And you're alone this Christmas. And it's just different for you. And, and there's no peace in that. Uh, there are people uh, who are watching or are gathered with us uh, where, where you are just coming through a divorce and this will be the first time in a long time that you are single at, at Christmas or maybe your kids are, are distant from you and you're just, there's a brokenness there and there is just very, very little peace. Am I right? For some people, it's like that. Now, for others of us, and for probably most of us in this room, uh, there is a whole different set of tensions that kind of surround the whole Christmas holiday. Uh, life gets very, very busy, and it is go, 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 and you have things to do and uh, presents to go buy and presents to wrap to get them under the tree, and you have parties and food to prepare for parties, and you got to get your kids or grandkids to this event or to this event or to that event, and, and you're just so busy that there is very little peace. Anybody ever find that? Christmas can be a little bit more hectic than you ever wanted it to be? Anybody? Then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, it is not peace in your world. It is anything other than peace on earth in your world. Uh, maybe your Christmas family gatherings look a little bit more like Jerry Springer than you would like to admit. And so for you, uh, Christmas can be a little bit messy. And that's why we're calling this series Chris Mess, because it's not always like the postcards. It's not always like the songs that we sing. Sometimes it's very, very messy. And you look around on earth. It is not peace on earth very often. It is a mess 
on earth. And so I just want to start by sharing a very simple verse of scripture that comes from Isaiah the great prophet. Uh, it was written about 700 years before the time of Jesus. And, and, and Isaiah is looking at the people of God, the people of Israel, and he, he is so stirred by what he sees because he sees brokenness. Uh, he sees um, he, he, he sees a, a tension in the life of the people of Israel and God stirs something deep inside of him and tells him to write. God tells him to write uh, that, there is, that there is a change coming. Hundreds of years before Christ was ever born, Isaiah was commanded to write, tell them that there is a child that is about to be born who is gonna change everything if you let him. Come on, there's a child coming who's going to be the deliverer, the Messiah, who's going to change your hope. He's going to change your direction if you let him. And these are the words that Isaiah writes before the time of Christ. He says this, uh, chapter uh, 9, verse 6, he says, For to us a child is born. Maybe you've heard these words, right? For to us, for unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And then Isaiah gives four names for this coming child. He gives four descriptions of, of what this person is going to do for humanity. Now listen carefully. He says, and they will call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and help me out with this one. Prince of peace. Prince of peace. Jesus is called the Prince of peace. And friends, I hope today, personally, no matter how you came into this space, whether you're watching online or at our video campus or even in this room, my hope is that you will experience peace that comes from God. A peace that, if you let it, it will catch you unaware. It will be surprising to you. It will be deeper and wider than you ever could imagine or understand. That's my hope for you, that you find peace, the peace that comes from God at Christmas. Now, I remember growing up, in my early teenage years, I went to uh, a friend's house on Christmas Eve uh, and joined his family uh, for Catholic Mass. And we were not Catholics at this time. Um, but I remember going to this Christmas Eve service and there was this uh, strange peace that I experienced. I can remember all of these years later, 30, 35 years ago, I remember this. And, and I remember they did stuff that I don't even understand or didn't understand then. And they sang songs that I didn't know the words, but it was beautiful. And there was this choir and there were these candles. And I remember being in this uh, huge old church that had these soaring ceilings and stained glass windows. And there was just this uh, strange sense of peace that rode over me, and I still remember it to this day. I remember growing up as a child in the middle of all of the Christmas chaos in the Chasso family with all four of us kids living in this tiny little house and all the presents on Christmas morning. I still remember uh, my father and my mother uh, carving out some space where we would gather around and we would put everything on hold and they would read the Christmas story to us straight from the pages of the Bible. And I remember there was just this strange peace that, that came with that. There was a settledness in my soul that came from this. And so if you have a Bible, I would love for you to find the book of Luke, chapter two, Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you have a smartphone, you can Google it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter two. And we are gonna read just a portion. We're gonna land and kind of almost start right in the middle of the Christmas story. And I don't mean the Christmas story that you see every you know, year, like with the little red rider, BB gun, kid pokes his eye out. Not that Christmas story. We're talking the original Christmas story. We're going to go way back. And, and so uh, we're in the middle of the Christmas story. At this point, the angels already visited Mary and Joseph and the whole deal. And we're going to just pick it up in Luke chapter 10 or chapter 2, verse 10, where, where he begins to paint this picture that there are these shepherds living out in a field. Now, we began to talk about this last week. And they are outside of the city of Bethlehem and they're doing their shepherding type of thing in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, these angels come to them. 
And I know this sounds weird, but they were terrified. And you would be terrified too if angels showed up to your place of work. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, unless you're like different than the rest of us, you don't see this very often. And so these angels show up, they're terrified. And you may remember the angel, one of the angels spoke and says, do not be what? Afraid. And here's why. Here's why. I bring you good news, listen, of great, that will cause great, what's the word? Great joy. Woo! More than happiness. Y'all remember this? But great joy. And there's something different because happiness seems to depend on your circumstance. Happiness seems to move with whatever you're running after, right? Happiness seems to change day by day what makes you happy. But joy is deeper. Joy is better. Joy doesn't move. Joy comes from God. And the angel goes on to say this, and you may remember this. It says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for who? All the people. And here's the joy. Here's where it's found. Uh, for for to you, a child, to this, this day, a child is going to be born who's going to be called the Messiah, who's the deliverer of his people. Now listen, friends, here's what happens next. Um, so the angel says this, and, and like the shepherds are going like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. How are we supposed to know what child? There's children born all the time. And then the angel says to the shepherds, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. You don't see too many babies lying in a pig trough very often. But when you find that baby, you're on to something. You find that baby and your whole world is going to change. And so they go looking for a baby, but on their way out, they get serenaded by this kind of host of, of heaven, right? And they start to talk or to chant or to sing this song to them. And then it says this, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men to whom his favor rests. Jesus is called the prince of Peace. And when the angels appeared, they said, peace on earth. One translation says, peace on earth and goodwill toward who? Toward men, right? Jesus, Jesus' birth, though, if you really stop and think about it, was far from peaceful. I mean, we talked a little bit about this last week. I mean, the whole deal opens up with, with an angel announcing to um, Mary, uh, this teenage girl, that you are going to be pregnant. You're going you're gonna to give birth to a child. Now, you imagine explaining that to your hardcore Jewish parents. How'd this happen? It's not my fault. I didn't do anything. Really? I mean, this is far from peaceful, right? Can you imagine telling your parents, it's God's fault? This whole thing, it's, it's God's fault, right? I mean, how crazy is this, right? And, then, and so if you were to plow through the Christmas story, it is far from peaceful. It doesn't begin peaceful and it doesn't end peacefully. You know how the, it ends? We don't often talk about this at Christmas time, but it ends terribly. Do you know how the Christmas story ends? If you go and track through it in Luke chapter two, there is this, there is this uh, segment or this section of scripture that describes what's happening historically at the moment. And this is true in history. And you can go back and find this for yourself in history. But what's interesting is Herod, who was king over the Middle East, who ruled for Rome in the Middle East, he hears that this prophetic word had been spoken. And that there was this Messiah to be born, this child to be born. And you know anything about Rome? They're not going to have any competitive king, period. Nobody's going to rule other than Rome. And so what does Herod do? Acting on behalf of the authority of Rome, he issues an order that, that all children in the region, in the land surrounding Bethlehem would be executed. All children from the age of two and below because he wanted to make sure that this coming king would never see the light of day. Because there's only room for one king in Rome. There's only room for one Caesar in Rome. And so you want, I want you to think about this. And so here you have the prince of peace born and all of these innocent children are being murdered. This is messy. This is not peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Right? Uh, the prince of peace is born and literally hell is unleashed in the lands of his birth. Where's the peace in that, friends? And none of this seems to make sense to me. When you read this, there's this declaration that says, peace is coming your way. But when you look and you go through all of human history, does that seem to have worked out very well? I mean, come on, you look down through human history, 
And what you see is war. You, you see murder. You see greed. You see poverty. You see selfishness. You see disease. You see brokenness. And none of this sounds too much to me like peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And I thought that Jesus was supposed to be the prince of peace. Now you fast forward a little bit and it's not just people in history. I see people in this very room who struggle deeply with anxiety and worry and depression. And there's no peace. I see people who are maxed out and stretched in every single capacity. Um, there's no peace. I, I, I know marriages, lots of them, even Christian marriages in this church who are struggling just to survive. You're not even sure you're going to make it through the holidays together. It is broken. And there is no peace, goodwill toward men. None. It's just not there. And, and I look at people who I know financially who are earning more money than they've ever earned in their entire lives, but they can't keep up because their spending is out of control. And they are stressed out and they are maxed out and they are broken. There's no peace in that, anybody? There's no peace. There's not hardly a week that goes by that we don't hear about somebody that we know who's overdosed on drugs. Somebody stealing something. Somebody losing something. Friends, there is very little peace in this world. Am I right? And we could go into your world and I think we could say the same thing. There are often times that there are these waves that come against us and it is far, far from peaceful. And so here's the question, friends. It says, unto us a child is born. And that child is going to be the, called the prince of peace. And he's going to bring peace to all men and goodwill toward all men. And the question is, is has that really happened? And so the question becomes, has God failed? Has Jesus been a failure? Well, I want to talk about this a little bit. Because the question is, is how do we get peace from God? How does this thing called peace really work? And so I want to, I want to show you something. If you were to go and, and look up the original translation, the Hebrew for the Prince of Peace quote from Isaiah, it, it, it literally means this, Sar Shalom. That, that's what it means, sar shalom. That's how you translate prince of peace into Hebrew, sar shalom. And, and what's interesting about this is this word sar. You know what this word sar means? It literally means the, the one who is in charge, the, the one who is the captain, the, the lord, the, the chief, the, the general, the, the prince. It is, it is the guy in charge. And so as you know from your history, Rome had a title. The ultimate title for the emperor was named what? Anybody? Caesar, and it's not Little Caesar's Pizza. Little Caesar's Pizza literally means the one who is in charge of pizza. That's what it means. And they picked the word Tsar, they grabbed this Hebrew expression, and they labeled it Caesar over Rome. In other words, the one who is the chief of Rome, the one who is the general of Rome, the one who was in charge of Rome, nobody else was in charge. And we are told that Jesus is the Sar Shalom. And what does the word Shalom mean? It's a Hebrew expression. It's very, very common. It, it literally means rest or tranquility or wholeness or completeness. It means peace. So Sar Shalom is the one who's in charge of peace, the one who gives peace, the one who commands peace. That's what it means. And so, so many of us say we believe in Jesus and we, we, we're told that the Prince of Peace has come and he's supposed to bring goodwill toward all men. And yet we don't see this. So what's the problem? Friends, do you think we're going to find peace? Like here, here it is, like we, 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 we get in here and we find some sort of peace, some sort of covering. And when we stay here, he is our Sar Shalom. When we're here, he brings peace. He brings covering. He brings tranquility to our life. But friends, listen, here's what happens is that we step outside of this and we go and get our girlfriend pregnant. And then we go, oh, I feel bad about this. And so I come running back in here and then all of a sudden we go, why isn't there peace in my life. I mean, I'm back in church. I'm back under, I'm, I'm singing songs about Jesus. I, I'm giving, I gave him four bucks this week. Where's the peace? Listen, my wife and I, we can have a big, hairy, knockdown fight and we can have soul unrest. And do you think just because I run back over here and go, oh, oh I need to get, oh, I'm, 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 I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. You think I'm going to find peace right away? Friends, listen, we, we, you, you max out your credit card, you live outside here, and you go, oh, I, I'm so stressed out, I can't, I can't pay for all this stuff, I, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do, uh, my whole life is slipping away from me. And so we run back and we go, 
oh, 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 where's the peace? Friends, I'm going to tell you where peace comes from. It, it doesn't come from living out here. It comes from when you get in here, you stay in here, and you live in here. It's when you willfully submit your life to the Sar Shalom, the one who gives peace. The one who gives peace is saying, I want to give you peace. But listen, you can't keep running outside of me. It's like a parent who wants to protect their children. I can protect you if you stay near me. But listen, if you're going to keep running down the street, I can't what? I can't protect you. I can't lead you. The Sar Shalom, it, we, we, when do we get peace? It's when we, when we come and, and we plant ourselves here. And there are times that we get out, we get out, and we go, oh, man, oh, man. And we get back in. But the longer we live out here, the peace goes away. Let me just ask a, a, a question. Be honest for a second. Anybody in the room ever have an experience where um, life just went south, and yet you experienced this weird sense of peace that came from God? I mean, it was falling apart, but you were just okay. Anybody in the room? Let me tell you something. Sar, shalom. God gives you a peace that you can't understand. He gives you a peace that, just, that, that passes your ability to think about it. You can't explain it. And like you're like, hey, you should be a wreck right now. And your friends are going, man, I bet you you're a mess. And you're like, no, 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 I'm okay. I know God has me. God's got me in this. But let me ask another question. Let's take our honesty up to a whole new level. Let me ask you, how many people have experienced this kind of peace that comes from God and yet <laughs> you moved away from it and yet you walked away from it and you no longer had soul peace. Anybody in the room? Anybody? You were here once and you lived here and it came crashing down and you're like, whoa, it's crashing down, but I'm okay, but I'm okay. But now at this point in your life, maybe, has anybody walked out and everything came crashing with it and soul peace left? Anybody in the room? Why is that, friends? Who moved? God or you? Now, let me tell you something about God. His love is so extravagant. It is so crazy for you that God will sometimes do this for you. You're standing here and you're kind of like in and out. You're standing right at the edge of that. And he's going to move that peace right away from you. You go, why would he do that? He is the Sar Shalom. He is the one who's supposed to be taking care of me. Sometimes God will remove all peace from your life in order to get your attention. He will take it from you so that you will realize you better get in deep. So that you better stay with him. And friends, there's people in this room who are not people of faith and you're going, I don't get it, man. It's one thing after another thing and I can't find any rest. I can't find any hope. I just don't get it. He is saying, listen, listen, you got to go in deep all the way. All the way. Let me tell you something about Jesus. This is what we know. Is that Jesus is the one who gives us calm. He is the one who brings calm calm into our life. Now, you may know this, but there's a couple of stories that come from the pages of Scripture that deal with Jesus on a large body of water. Now, if you've ever been on a large body of water, uh, I'm not much of a fishing kind of a guy, but I got friends who are, and I've been out on large bodies of water, and let me tell you something. The weird thing about a sea, the weird thing about a large-scale lake is that the thing can change in a moment. Am I right? You can go from calm, it's like you and your Diet Coke, you're fine, everything, and all of a sudden the captain's going, you better grab onto that Diet Coke because things are getting choppy right about now. Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? Things go out of control crazy. Well, one of the things that we know about Jesus' earliest followers is that half of them were professional fishing men. They were on the sea. Normally, they lived in Galilee. And what's in Galilee? The Sea of Galilee. They, they lived their whole lives in, on the sea. They understood that things could go from calm to rough. But listen to this story. This is amazing. It says this, uh, Matthew chapter eight, listen to this. Matthew chapter eight, verse uh, 23, it says, then he, Jesus, got into the boat with some of his disciples that followed him, right? Suddenly, suddenly, what's the word suddenly mean? Suddenly. It means right away. 
it, like unpredictable, right? It's like you didn't have Doppler 7000 going on, right? You, this like just came out of the blue, okay? And it's like suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake without warning so that the waves, listen, so that the waves swept over the boat. Without warning, this furious storm comes. Now, let me just pause for a second. Anybody in the room ever been caught in a big storm? I mean, just out of nowhere. And by the way, I'm not talking about rain. I'm not talking about wind and thunder. I'm talking about lightning. I'm talking about has a life storm ever come up on you? Like out of the blue. Anybody? It's like you were fine. You were cruising down the road. Everything was okay. And all of a sudden, uh, your husband says, I just don't love you anymore. And a storm hits. You go to the doctor because you thought you had a little cough. But he says, it's cancer. Your boss calls you in. You knew your company was struggling. But boy, he says, it's over. We're done. All of us, we're done. It's gone. And you lost your job. Or you get a phone call and it's your kid who's just been picked up for drinking and driving. And he's caused a major accident and somebody's really hurt. And a storm has come. Anybody ever been caught in a storm? Come on. Here's what happens. The storm comes up and it's amazing. And it, here's what we learn. This is crazy. So the boat's rocking. The waves are coming over the edge. The guys we learn are like literally freaking out. And here's what the scripture says. You may want to help me out. But Jesus was, that's crazy. But Jesus was, say it again, sleeping. The, the disciples went to him and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. These guys were flipping out. These guys were freaking out. Like the, the, the boat's rocking and they're like, hey, we're fishermen. We've been out on the sea and this doesn't look good. We've seen our buddies go down. We've seen our family go down. This does not look good. And Jesus, if you're anything, you can help us now because we've seen you do some tricky stuff before. And now would be a good time for one of those sort of tricks. But it says... Jesus was sleeping. Why? Because he is the Tsar Shalom. <laughs> and this makes sense. He's at peace because he is the one who gives peace. Come on. He, he, he's at calm because he is the one who gives calm. Right? And so he is just sleeping away and these guys flip out and he's like, whoa, whoa, you're waking me up. You're waking me up. And he notices right away that everybody is flipping out and the waves are coming, the water. And then listen to this. It says, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? <laughs> and then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. And it was, say this word, it was completely calm. It's completely calm. So I don't know if this is exactly what goes on, but you can see this picture, right, in your mind. The boat's rocking. You've been on a boat that's kind of going, oh boy, oh boy. But this is like really oh boy. It is like water is coming over the bow of the boat and it is like, you know, it is like make it or break it time. And so what we do know is Jesus says to these guys, why are you afraid? Where is your faith in all of this? And the boat's rocking. They're like, our faith is gone because it is rocking in here and it does not look good. And so Jesus goes right to the edge of the boat and he's getting hit by the water. It's coming over. It's like the Titanic movie, right? And, and he's, it's coming over and listen, and all of a sudden he goes, Shalom! 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 The giver of peace who commands peace the one who brings calm commands calm. And some of us feel like our life is rocking and it is so shaky and there is no peace. And I'm telling you, friends, God is whispering and he is shouting over you. He might even be screaming over you. Shalom. Shalom from me. You need to get inside of here. You need to stay with me in here. This is where you're going to find peace in here. There's another story in the scriptures of Jesus doing the whole water thing. And this one's a little bit different. This is where we kind of enter the, the supernatural. That's not supernatural because it says that after Jesus proclaims this calm, after he proclaims his peace, it says it was calm. 
it was peace. But there's another story where there is a, uh, the, the disciples get into this boat and they head out. And this is where we figure out that Jesus is not like us at all. Because here is what happens next. Listen to this. There's a whole different water situation. But listen to this. It says, it says, meanwhile, the disciples were far away from the land for a strong wind had risen against them and they were fighting heavy waves. We learn that they went ahead of Jesus and Jesus was not with them at all. But then something happens. Again, let me ask a quick question. Anybody ever been caught in a storm? A life storm? Anybody? Because these guys are caught in a life storm. And here's what happens. Um, these guys have been out here before. And they've been out here before with Jesus, but this time Jesus is not with them. And, and, and yet, here's what happens. This is very interesting. It, it, the, the whole thing is rocking and the whole thing is rolling and they're freaking out. And yet, one of them is kind of looking out going, this doesn't look good. This doesn't look good. Last time we had Jesus with us, we don't have Jesus with us. Sorry, boys, we're going down. And he's looking out over the bow. And it says that all of a sudden he sees this figure coming toward them. And we learn later that it's Jesus. And he's not like on a personal watercraft, jet ski kind of a thing. He is walking on the water. And he is walking through the storm right at them. And what's interesting to me, it says when they, when they saw that he got closer and closer, it says that they thought he was a ghost and he was, anybody know the word? Terrified. They were terrified. I'm thinking they're already terrified. But now they're not terrified from sinking. They're terrified because they see a ghost. They're freaked out. And what we learn is that they're doing this whole deal and all of a sudden they get closer and closer and they realize it's Jesus. And then there's this one follower, his name is Peter. And he does something that really probably none of us would ever do. But he remembers the last time he was with Jesus, he was safe. <laughs> and he thinks, I'm not safe where I'm at. And he goes and he does something crazy. This is what happened. Uh, it, it says, but, but Jesus spoke to them. They see this ghost and Jesus speaks to them and says, do not be, what's this word again? Afraid. Take courage. I am here. Woo! Somebody needs to say amen in this place. He says, I am here. He goes, I'm here. And guess what I bring? Sar Shalom. I bring peace. I bring calm. He goes, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And don't you forget it. And then listen to this. Peter, one of his closest says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come out to you walking on the water. And Jesus says, you gotta love this. Yes, come, uh, Jesus said. Yeah, come, it, it, it's great out here. It's, just, it's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's way better than being in the boat. It's way better. This is crazy, right? And so Peter did something that almost none of us would do. He goes over the side of the boat and he walks on water toward Jesus. And at first he's like, Ooh, this is sweet. It says that he is walking toward Jesus. And I know we're entering the supernatural. I know this gets weird, but don't miss the big picture of the story. He is focused on who? Jesus. He's walk walking toward the one who can bring peace, the one who can bring calm, right? And he's on, he's targeted and it's going good. He's like, this is the greatest thing guys. You ought to come out too. This is really awesome out here. It is a little chilly, but it is awesome. And then the scripture says that he looks away. That he moves from in there to out here. And something shifts inside of him. And it moves. And then the scripture says uh, that, that, but when he saw that those strong winds and the waves that were, were coming, he was terrified and he began to what? Sink. And he cries out, save me, Lord. Save me. And friends, what did he do? He took his eyes off of Sar Shalom, the one who could give peace. And friends, let me tell you something. We talked about this last week a little bit. When you chase after stuff, you get wind. You chase wind. It's always moving and you're never gonna catch it. When the object of our pursuit of our life, the greatest hope in our life becomes Jesus, we find joy. And when we take our eyes and we fix them on Jesus and we say, we're gonna get in and we're gonna stay right here and it's gonna be good right here. And I know there's every temptation to get out here, but I think I'm just gonna stay right here. When we stay right here, guess what? It's good. And he holds us. But when we step out, we begin to, to sink. And I'm guessing a whole bunch of us in this very room, we would know this to be true. 
that when we move outside of the covering of God, things just start to come unraveled. But Jesus is good. He is faithful. And listen to what happens. It says that Peter calls on him. And then Jesus reaches toward him. And listen, it says Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. He says, you of so little faith, why did you doubt me? Why did you move out of my covering? Why did you take your eyes off of me? I bring calm, I bring peace, and you are looking at something else. I don't get it. I just don't get it. Friends, when we take our focus of our life off of God, our souls do not have peace. Our souls do not have rest. We break our soul. We break our communion with God. Jesus brings calm, but he also saves. Let me tell you something about Jesus. He reaches, like Peter's going down, and Jesus says, oh, come on, man, I told you a hundred times. And yet he still reaches, and he pulls him up. He rescues. And he says, you know what? I told you a hundred times you should stay right here. But you step out and I'm just going to keep nudging you back. I'm just going to keep nudging you back. Let me, let, me, let me share a thought that comes uh, from a different book in the Bible. It's uh, found in the book of Romans chapter 5 and Paul is writing to the people of Rome and he's saying, man, you want to find peace with God? You got to stop thinking it's all about what you do. Let me tell you something. You think, here's what happens to a whole bunch of us. We get out of this and we spend time here. We know it's good, but we get out, we start screwing things up. And so we try to make it up to God. Anybody ever tried doing this? It can't be just me. You act a little nicer. You pray a little bit more. You give four bucks. You help out with seven families. You know what I'm talking about? You, you try to make it up. You volunteer. I don't really want to do kids' church on Christmas Eve, but I want to do it anyways because I really screwed this up and I, got, I owe God something. Let me tell you something. You never earn your way to God. You can't work your way to God. The only way to find peace with God is through this thing called faith. Putting your whole trust inside of him. Let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like this. It says, therefore, uh, since we have been made right with God in God's sight by this thing called what? faith. Woo! We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Amen? Amen? Listen, the Christian faith is not spelled do, D-O, by what you do. Like I screwed up, so I'm going to do more to fix it with God. I, I've gotten out of this, and so I'm thinking I'm going to walk back over here. I'm going to get it right just for a little bit, and then I'm going to try to get on my own out here. No, it is not about what you do. It is about D O N E. It is what Christ has done for you. This is the Christmas story that there is this gift from God. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. He gave His Son to draw us back to God, to be our Sar Shalom, to be the one who grabs us and pulls us and reaches toward us. It is a great gift of God. Listen, Christ paid for my sin penalty. I know God deserves to judge me. I know that I am not right before God on my own. And my guess is, you know the blackness of your own soul as well. Am I right? And God chooses to forgive you because of Christ. He says, I'm going to take all of your sin, all of your junk, and I'm, instead of judging you, I'm going to put it all on Christ. And the scripture says that he gave up his life for us and that whoever would believe in him, trust in him, would camp out right here, they can be made right with God. Peace with God. Now listen, I'm preaching way better than y'all are reacting right now because that's good news. That's really, really good news. A long time ago, um, there were these two monks, an older monk who was kind of the master of the abbey and this younger apprentice monk. They had work to do in the local city, so they left their abbey and they went on this couple hour journey walk to the city. And when they get to the gate of the city, uh, the elder monk says to the younger monk, I will meet you back here in the morning after we perform all of our duties. Um, we will meet back here and we will walk back to the abbey together. And so they had this little arrangement. The very next morning, the senior monk, he shows up at the gate in time, at the gate of the city, and he's getting ready to go back. And he notices his young friend is lagging behind. He doesn't show up for the longest time, and eventually he shows up. He says, what's the problem, my son? Where were you? We were supposed to meet here an hour ago. Where were you? And this young man says, what business is it of yours? 
He tells the, his elder monk, his, his abbey master, he, he, he says, what business is it of yours? Why do you care? Why are you always interrog interrogating me? Why? And this hurt the feelings of the elder monk. And they begin to walk back toward home together, back toward the monastery. And, and as they're walking, he starts to notice that the younger monk starts getting further and further behind, lagging further and further behind. And eventually they arrive at the gate of the monastery. Now there's a great distance between them. And the elder monk, he stands at the gate of the monastery. And now he knows that this young monk is troubled. And he says to the young monk when he finally arrives, he says, he says what is it, my son? Why, why do you have so much anger? What, what is going on in your soul? And this young monk, at first, he reacts just like he did the other time. But then he notices the depth of warmth in the old man's eyes, the depth of caring. And he says, Father, I have sinned so greatly. Last night I was with a woman and I broke my vows. And I am so sorry. I do not deserve to walk into the abbey with you. Side by side. I cannot do it. And this old monk put his arm around this young guy and says, we will walk into the abbey together. Then we will go into the church together. And we will bow at the altar together. And we will confess our sin together. And nobody will know the difference between who fell, me or you. No one. Only God. Friends, this is what Christ does for us. He carries our sin. He carries our burden. He brings peace where there is no peace. He makes us right before God when we trust him. When we put our hope and our confidence in him. Friends, if you want to know the shalom of God in your life, Get in here. Stay in here. Live in here. Even when you think it's hard. Even when God is calling you to something that you go, I'm not so sure I'm ready to do that. I'm not so sure I want to obey that. That's going to change my life. Yes, it will. But you will find peace with God here every single day. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, um, sometimes we really make a mess of our life. And God, I don't know why, but we walk away from you. And some of us have trouble even trusting you at all. And so God, I just pray that somehow in some way your Holy Spirit right now in this very room would meet with us. God, for those who are on the front end and they're not so sure they can trust you, but they know that there is no peace down deep in their soul and they've tried a million things. God, I pray that your spirit would speak into their life. God, I pray that they would realize that that, that loss of peace, that emptiness, that shallowness, the, the storm is really meant to tell them that you are near and that you want them to move toward you. God, for those of us who have been on this journey with you for a long time, I pray, Father, that, that we would move inside of your shelter, that we would camp out there, and that we would trust at whole new levels. If you're calling us to serve, we will serve. If you're calling us to change something, we will change something. If you're calling us to give, we will give. God, that we will trust you at whole different levels. Jesus, I pray that you would bring shalom into the hearts of your people, the people that you love. Speak, oh God, say this to him, speak, oh God, for your child is listening. Amen.